What's up, guys? I am your host, ASC Praise, and I will be bringing you part two today of the follow-up video to our Forgotten Spells where we highlighted the Oracle. In this episode, I'm going to be following up by talking about the tactics, flight, and efficiency of the Oracle, extreme casting opportunities, and then wrapping up with some other considerations that will be super beneficial to your play when you decide to use the Oracle, because this is a phenomenal unit that you don't want to miss out on the benefits for, for Protoss. So I'm going to start off with showing you guys a diagram. Now, for those of you who don't know, this map is Frozen Temple, and all of the things I'm going to be discussing about this map are in the assumption that you are spawning in the bottom right-hand side of the map. If you ever spawn on the top left, simply flip this diagram around, and uh, you can even edit and revise and revisit this diagram all you guys want. It's just to wrap your mind around all of the things most people don't consider when using the Oracle. So if we start off on the left-hand side, I have highlighted the harass patterns, dead space, and expansions. These are also color-coded, so as I walk through them, watch the corresponding color on the map. So starting with harass patterns, I've shown that on the map in the top left by showing you four uh, red lines. These lines are just showing you the directional path that the oracle should be flying on when thinking about harassing on this map. I've also highlighted that by showing the arrow path there in white right below the line. And this shows you where you're supposed to start with your flight pattern and end. In StarCraft II, when you're using the Oracle, in most cases when you're harassing, it's best to roll up right beside a mineral line uh, but there are some rare cases in your openers or even in the late game when further out expansions start going down where it's okay to just roll into an entire mineral line as quick as possible and just start blasting units. I've indicated that by the yellow line that sits in almost a smile shape around the back of the mineral lines. So if in the event of the earlier or late, later game you have instances where you're going in to harass a bare mineral mineral line which doesn't have any static defense, that's the flight pattern that you're going to want to take. You're going to want to take a wide smile shape around the back of the mineral line. That's how you'll mostly be able to attack the units the most efficiently. I think I'll talk about this a little bit later in the video, but you got to remember the flight path of the Oracle. To make it turn 180 degrees, you have to click the line path that it's flying on completely accurately. It's a straight line. So if you don't click on that path, Path to turn or rotate, the unit will go in more of an O or U shape to make that correction. And that's really important when talking about the flight path because that can be the difference between two to five ish uh, worker kills, which is extremely important. Every little bit counts. So if you're dealing with a bare mineral, mineral line when it comes to harass, use the yellow lines for references. That's the wide smile uh, behind the mineral line. If you are dealing with uh, missile turrets or queens or spore crawlers, um, um, or cannons or blink stalkers, you want to roll up beside the mineral line and do a quick little circle along the edges. Um, notice also that on the quicker outer edge circles, I have them on the outermost part, not on the innermost part of the mineral line, because it has the quickest ability for you to retreat to an attack or to the dead space, which is our second topic. I've indicated the dead space by showing our green X's on the map. Now, obviously, again, I've only put these illustrations down for the top left portion of the map, but ideally, if we were um, you know, touching on this completely, we'd cover the entire map for all of its dead space. But again, I didn't want to be overwhelming. The green areas on this map indicate all of the dead space where your oracle can sit without really being harassed in the event that, th that there's no anti-air. So I've picked out all of these areas in kind of a boundary circle around the base. Typically when you're moving your oracle from its stop, stop point to moving it to do whatever you're going to do, you want to travel from X to X. This allows you to have a very quick action, a very specific intention when using the oracle, and a place to rest where you know you can get back to your macro and other important uh, things that you need to take care of. So again, you want to typically have your movement behavior connect the dots from X to X. You know, so for instance, in the main, if you're going to travel around the back of the mineral line, you want to start in the top right and then move all the way around the back of the mineral line and have the unit stop in the dead space or continue to move until you're done casting your spells to the next possible X. Also, I've talked about the expansions and why are those important for the Oracle? Well, in this case, um, 
I am using it to talk about the expansions in Stasis Ward. When you're casting your Stasis Ward, you want to be considering the expansions, so you always know which expansion to go to and plant the Stasis Ward. Again, as I said before, you also want to consider that when an expansion's being thrown down, you can just kill the worker as opposed to putting down a stasis ward, but it does have its function in some scenarios because um, to plant the stasis ward, you'd have to kind of be in open space and are more susceptible to being picked off in the mid game. So the stasis ward absolutely has its place in all three of the matchups. I also wanted to talk to you guys about the white arrows that I have, and I drew these just to show the attack paths, the, and I'm referring to the three long arrows that I have uh, towards the center of the map. When, you, when it comes to analyzing a map, you want to have as much map coverage as possible, and the, or, the Oracle can't always grant that vision to you all over the place, though it is very powerful. So it's important that, for instance, you understand all the attack paths, because maybe you'll plant a stasis ward or cast revelation on different things on these attack path areas so that you can account for them. So maybe you'll throw a pylon on one side of the map, or two pylons, or an adept, or a zealot, just to have vision of these attack paths or you might put a stasis ward down to plug an attack path that'll cover for your harass the army move outs and again this will give you the peace of mind to roam the map um, more peacefully without taking any serious critical damage the stasis ward i know for instance in pvt is super critical because say if your opponent does a doom drop then if you have a stasis ward at home or, a, or down another attack path, perhaps on a move out, you can completely freeze that army or most of it and have enough time to come back and create your static defense. Okay, now that we've got that out of the way, let's talk about our scouting priorities, which is no located on the right-hand side. This, in my opinion, is how you should prioritize your oracle use. First and foremost, you want to think about harass. Then you want to think about scouting your opponent, uh, particularly his army, then his tech, expansions, and then the attack paths. That's the order that you should be in, and as you move along, you might take priorities off of your list that you already have coverage for, but that's usually how the game develops in my mind of what you should be paying attention to. Again, we're dealing with Pulsar Beam, so with Pulsar Beam, you want to be thinking about the harass patterns, uh, as well as cleanup areas at your own base where you might want to hold off uh, some sort of harass or drop. You want to be thinking about the dead space. That's where the unit is sitting and resting in to, to contain more energy. It's also the retreat uh, target where you're trying to escape from uh, getting picked off. And then you want to think about the expansions and how you can best delay them. You might not always use the Oracle to delay the expansion, but nonetheless, you can dart around the map and see where the expansions are taking place with this very quick unit. Now, let's dive into our next subject, which is extreme casting opportunities. Now, the Oracle can have up to 200 energy. It starts with 100 life and 60 energy, I believe. Don't quote me on that. I'm pretty sure that's the case, though. Um, the Oracle also takes roughly four minutes to regen to 100%. That means half of that, two minutes to gain half energy, uh, and then uh, one minute to gain 25% of the energy of the unit. So that's really important when considering how often you might be in dead points on the map or still. And it also allows you to not have to revisit the Oracle when it hasn't even gathered energy yet um, to cast another spell. That's another issue I found myself doing a lot of times is once you hotkey the Oracle, you'll often revisit it to try and maximize damage. But if you've already used a couple of the spells, you may be just going to it and wasting APM because it hasn't regened. So knowing those time uh, frames, you know, with, with your... Uh, with your unit is very helpful in being efficient and not spending any unneeded time with the unit. So if you have a full energy oracle, you have the option to cast up to four revelations or four stasis wards or a mixed use of these spells, including pulsar beam. Now remember, pulsar beam is a little bit cheaper, uh, but you have to activate and deactivate that spell. So for one-time use, again, four revelations, four stasis wards, or you can mix it up, give or take uh, the effect of it if you're adding in pulsar beam. Lastly, to wrap this all up, I just have some other considerations for you when thinking about the oracle. 
just a couple of little factoids. So two oracles can one-shot workers in all three of the matchups. This is very helpful. Um, if you only have one oracle, it does kill workers really fast, but uh, one-shotting oracles is a lot more efficient if you're able to get up to two oracles, and it, and it is extremely powerful. Uh, it can cut the seconds in half uh, for time spent uh, with your harass movement. Also, I talked a little bit about the turn radius. If you want the unit to make a 180 degree turn immediately, you have to have clicked uh, in the space behind the unit on a straight line path. Everything else you do will cause the unit to kind of donut around to make the adjustment. Um, you want to think about the travel paths, such as the dead space and avoiding the attack paths. You never want your oracle to be sitting around on any of the attack paths. Put a stasis ward down or just completely avoid it by being somewhere in dead space. Uh, oftentimes, if you want to bait your opponent, for instance, you can throw down a stasis ward and put your oracle behind it. That way, if your opponent sees it and tries to stim in or blink in or use some space, uh, speed links to run down a path you'll just freeze the units completely that's a tactic I haven't seen as much but I have started to see in PVZ some quick move outs where you might stasis ward in front of your army if you're afraid it's going to get killed and it kind of allows you to have a retreat path uh, in some cases also why is the oracle better than the observer well it's quite simple it's multifunctional it's faster, it provides multi-coverage, and it also frees up the robo to be using more production for units as opposed to observers. Though I'm not completely canceling out the observer, it definitely has its place. S using the oracle very well can free you up from having to make up you know, any observers, or if so, keeping the observer production down to a minimum. You also want to make the job of the oracle easier, and map vision allows this. Uh, one of the things I hadn't quite touched on in detail is just that spotter adepts, spotter pylons, and spotter zealots can be critical to freeing the um, oracle up to doing some of the other things like casting revelation, stasis, and pulsar beam. So when you incorporate these things, the oracle is free to do more important stuff, point blank period. Revelations uh, are also just super clutch in any of the matchups because they strike fear into your opponent. Anytime you reveal your opponent, it's like catching them off guard. They're naked. They don't know what to do, and they're more likely to change up their play, which is also very cool. And you don't even have to pay attention to your opponent. Just cast the revelation and walk off and know that it probably did something to your opponent. And scaring your opponent is a very much used tactic in StarCraft II. Also, uh, to clean up here, developing a rhythm for the Oracle's objectives should be as routine as possible with small room for extra attention so that the macro and other tasks that you have to do in the game are never hindered. So start building a rhythm, customize your flight patterns and what you think is important to do with your Oracle, and that way you know exactly how you want to use your Oracle and don't have to make a lot of time for adjustments because this will really wear down on your macro and micro uh, if you spend too much time with the Oracle. So develop those routines and rhythms, guys, and it will change your play entirely. I hope this video was super helpful. Again, my little charge lots, we've covered a ton of information that I've put together to highlight the beauty of one of the most underused units in the game. For your convenience, if you want to come back to this video or part one more conveniently, I will be sure to take several timestamps um, and place them in the, de in the description of part one and part two. And this will allow you to skip to different parts of the video and recap specific areas that I discussed without having to listen through all of the information if you so choose. If you guys like my video, feel free to follow me on my uh, Twitch channel, follow me on Twitter where I have memes and information and when I'm streaming and all my new episodes that get released on my YouTube channel. Subscribe to the YouTube, share these videos, I'm down for all the critique that you need. Again, this is some of your more in-depth stuff. This is only a channel for StarCraft fanatics and to get people more hype about the game again. I look forward to bringing you guys more episodes on this series, The Forgotten Spells. And I really enjoy putting these together for you guys. Again, my name is ASC Praise, and you're watching Praise TV, the place where we discover all things Protoss as it relates to my favorite game, StarCraft II Legacy of the Void. Peace.